guiding hand of natural selection in our world is quite firmly holding a fork. How we eat largely describes how this world is used. Food nourishes a lot more than just our bodies. It creates community, it brings us together, and it certainly nourishes our soul and brings us health. Not only does food describe to a great extent the biology of our existence here, but through food we are able to write the biography of our existence. So the first thing we want to start off with is just basic stories of sort of restaurant madness. Now restaurants are a difficult business. Each and every single one of us uh, in this industry have experienced our fair share of ridiculousness. You know, what sort of stories would you like to share with us? Well, actually, I, um, when I first opened Hank's Oyster Bar in DuPont, you know, I wanted to open a, a restaurant that was small enough where I could do pretty much everything myself. In our first couple of weeks of being open, we were very busy, and my manager quit, and two of my shuckers didn't show up for work on Saturday night. I have to cook the line, I have to expedite, I'm gonna have to seat people, and I'm gonna have to shuck. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what was I thinking? <laughs> so, fortunately, um, a guy named Tony walked in the door looking for a job. Not only was he looking for a job, he could start that night, <laughs> and he was a shucker. <laughs> so it was like a dream come true. So, uh, you know, from one extreme to the next, and that's how the restaurant business is for me. Yeah. I think what, what Jamie's saying is in, the, in that business, and I think you have to be, those of you out there that are in it know that you have to be a little crazy to get in in the first place, right? And, and, and you work really hard to be lucky, like, like Jamie felt she was that night, but she had worked really hard, but I think that's something we all uh, share. When I had, I had worked for a dozen years to get to a point where I was gonna open up my own restaurant and I thought this was the culmination of my career and this was, it was gonna be easy from here on out, right? Um, I, I refer to my uh, four plus years now owning and operating my own restaurant as my first experience in the nonprofit sector uh, <laughs> before I got to the kitchen, but the, the thing that, that that the recurring thought I had every day when I woke up was, Who, whose job am I gonna do today? Uh, am I gonna be waiting tables? Am I gonna be tending bar? Am I gonna be cooking? Uh, but the beauty of it was, it, it was all about that creating that community and that service, and so whatever job you were doing had meaning and importance, and uh, it, it, it brought something else to other people, and I think that's a common theme that we'll probably talk about a lot tonight, but certainly weaves through food uh, and the power of community to that, that it creates. I remember um, at B. Smith's uh, one year, busiest, busiest weekend of the year is uh, Mother's Day weekend with um, Mother's Day on Sunday, of course, and all the graduations. My pastry chef, um, you know, her daughter, her children worked there. Her husband was the food runner. Um, her daughter-in-law was, it was like seven of them that ran the, that were in my kitchen out of 27 people. So that's a significant amount. Saturday morning, busiest weekend of my life that, that, that year, they weren't there. I found out that it was because their visas had expired. And what we did, I, I spent uh, quite a bit of money and time at Costco that morning and that weekend. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, they got some great chocolate cake and some nice rolls. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, it was a southern restaurant, and um, so rolls, cornbread, huge for us. And uh, I, you know, people didn't miss a beat. I mean, all those people, <laughs> They had no idea. We got compliments, and we kept Costco until we replaced the, the sous chef. But uh, I mean, you know, we did. And I, I got to be honest with you, um, Costco doesn't. We'll talk about preservatives and sustainability uh -huh. and yeah, GMOs, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but they do they do an excellent cornbread. Everything they do a great cornbread. I don't know what's in it. <laughs> but, yeah. Sorry, Barton. Sorry. I know that doesn't fit in with with your whole shtick, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do what I had to it do. It takes all kinds. Yeah. Five, five <laughs> minutes in, we're already off the rails. Right. Yeah. Uh, that really proved something to me and my cooks that worked, the people that really hung in there with me. It was, you know, I slept there that night and I opened up the next morning, all three nights. I slept in my office. My wife was not happy. Um, but I, I did it and I was proud of myself. I'm still, I love that, I love it because I know I can do it. And if, uh, you know, another pastry chef decides she wants to, you know, her ex visa expires, I can do it again. Yeah. So. I mean, I had one time, uh, you know, when I was running Hook, we were really known for serving a huge diversity of seafood. 
We had a lot of different uh, fishermen that we just dealt with. And if you catch it, we'll buy it, you know? That's great. Um, we had more Autobahn guides in my kitchen than we had cookbooks, because every day I had to figure out just what the hell it was I was serving. <laughs> and, um, you know, one day we had 600 reservations on the books Thursday night. I mean, we were busy. I was already stressed out. The fish didn't come. So I finally, you know, finally the box shows up, and I call up my fish provider. I was like, Michael, what exactly did you send me? And my, my language was, of course, perfectly gentlemanly, <laughs> proper and prim. And he said, well, you know, we, we had a bad day fishing. But, uh, you know, I didn't want to leave you in a lurch. So, uh, well, we just sent you all the leftover bait. I hope you can do something with it. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my. Pulled all my cooks off the line. And, hey, you know, flying fish. Why not? We can, we can work with this, you know. And filleting fish is already an art form. Why not? Throw a wing bone structure onto it. No problem. <laughs> you know what I told my servers? I told them the absolute truth. We took that filleting fish, you know, filleted it up. Uh, a little bit of tarragon, lemon zest, olive oil. Rolled it up like roll mops. Rosemary skewered it. Two little things smoldered it over an orchard wood fire. 250 smoky, sexy, seductive degrees. Put it over a Vidalia onion and juniper broth into which was braised zucchini and summer squash. Sold mm. it there with a little bit of herb salad on top of it. I hope you all have had dinner already. Um, <laughs> we sold out a flying fish that night by 7 o'clock. Awesome. And... Uh, to this day, I still have people asking me, like, hey, when do you get more flying fish? I'm like, I can't even get fishermen to send it to us. But the next topic that I sort of want to get on, because we are in the midst of celebrity here, is uh, the rise of, of the celebrity food culture. And uh, this has radically altered, really, the shape uh, and nature of our industry. And I want to point out, first off, that uh, you know, Rock has really been one early adopters of this who've really been able to take advantage of it, but also then to talk about how this has changed our industry. What it's done is given us a larger voice. So we have mm -hmm. heroes that can work at Harvard. I mean, that's pretty freaking cool. And talk about food and you know how it impacts the globe and how we can sort of take this thing back and really have some huge impact. And 15 years ago, you, you tell someone that you made some with cilantro, they were amazed. Now it's just like, listen, you know, I got a, I got a, I got an emergent circulator in my basement, buddy. You know, <laughs> when you come when you come out to the table, you better talk to me about some real food. You know, people are, are more educated, they're 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 informed, they're empowered. So that's the one thing I appreciate and I'm extremely grateful for about the television aspect is that it's given us a voice. Now, what we do with that voice once we get on the stage is totally up to us. What's fascinating for us at, at The Kitchen is I think it's very fair to say that The Kitchen was really built on the back of the hospitality industry, restaurants in particular, and chefs. That's really how the whole thing started. And if it wasn't for the incredible support of that community and the belief in what we were trying to create at that time, we would not be where we are now. And what's been incredibly rewarding for us is to see these chefs that as their celebrity has grown, so too has their commitment to the community. To really create good, to create change in the community in a way that I think benefits us all. My interview process, we, uh, you know, I'd ask uh, potential cooks to, to cook something, right? That, I mean, that's a pretty reasonable expectation. I was getting kids cooking deconstructed beef stew with sous vide beef with carrot foam and celery jelly and air, you know onion a specter of onion real, like, real food I was like what like, what is this wait do you know how to construct beef stew uh, <laughs> Not that there's not value in that food, but it's sort of it, it's all based on foundation and. Um, yeah, I found that that could be a detriment, and then sort of that willingness to step over some of the, some, the such fundamental processes of building beef stew before you learn how to deconstruct it. Along those same lines, you know, chefs in the limelight really have the opportunity to create incredible influence. And I think the ultimate food hero, Alice Waters. Forty years ago, Alice Waters began to ask a simple question. What is the food that we're eating? And what is it doing to us? What is it doing to our community? And I think that's a question that has certainly influenced each and every person on this stage. And I'd love to, to ask each of you to speak to how she has influenced us and, and how you, uh, in your own way, have sort of carried on that work. 
So what I, what I do is I, I work very closely with my oyster farmers. We sell, um, you know, we go through thousands and thousands of oysters a week. And I, I, I offer six different kinds of oysters every night. And we change them every night. So I have a lot of different oyster farmers that, that a lot of local farmers, small farmers that farm just specifically for me. So for me, she's influenced me in that way where I'm really um, looking at the local product um, and trying to maintain a sustainable um, um, product. And you know, the fish, we try to always use local fish as much as we can, um, abide by the Monterey Bay Seafood Aquarium guidelines for sustainable fish, which I think is very important. At one point in my career, you know, it was just like, listen, people want steak. They want steak, they want beef, they want chicken. I don't care where it's coming from. I don't want to hear that. Then I'm like, whoa, Monsanto is nuts. <laughs> I'm not serving any of that, you know, and, and I've done a lot of stuff with the, um, you know, on, you know, with the Pew Charitable Trust, uh, you know, antibiotic free and organic. And so I teetered. And now, right now, where I am now, I was speaking about, you know, buying organic. I was in um, Greater Southeast uh, Hospital and speaking to people that, you know, food stamps are being cut. And I'm talking about healthy, I was promoting my book. And I'm talking about healthy cooking for kids. They bought a bunch of my books. And I'm like, and I went to, because I was out of butternut squash, I went to the, the, the Yes Organic, or one of those organic, right in Pennsylvania Avenue, east of the river. And butternut squash was like $8 for four ounces. And I went back to this demo. And I'm just like, you know what? You know. OK, we got to relax for a moment here. Local, local, local. It's great, awesome. But we can have strawberries, California strawberries, because of advances in transportation and refrigeration and things of that nature. And it's not a horrible thing. I know it, you know, I'm a carbon footprint. I get all of that jazz. But we have made, you know, probably scientists are like, hey, what are, you know, we, we changed the world. Um, so I'm sort of, we have to do it responsibly. I don't know, I'm, you know, you're probably like, Barton's over there like, I'm going to beat this guy up when we get back to the game. <laughs> but I think that <laughs> I'm saying, you know, I, I feel like we got to feed a bunch of people. And Americans, or people in general, need to eat, like to eat at the kitchen, run, you know, being the director of kitchen operations for a little bit. Am I going to say, you know, no thank you to 5,000 pounds of ground beef from a, a, a tech, you know, from a, a beef grower in Texas that had an overrun? No, because we got 5,000 people to feed. I wish I could serve organic beef and chicken all the time, but you all aren't paying $42 for a chicken sandwich at my restaurant, right. so. So I, I think R Rock is right that, that it's all about balance. We, we started a couple years ago a program where we're putting local, or not local, but fresh fruits and vegetables, um, whole vegetables, value-added cut products into corner stores in the city's food deserts. Uh, we're servicing 64 corner stores now, mostly in wards seven and eight east of the river. And sales are increasing every month in these stores where people thought that would not happen. You know, people would say, you know, those people won't buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, if they're not on the shelves, they'll be right 100% of the time. No one, will, no one will buy that, what's, no one will buy what's not there. Uh, and I was so excited to tell Alice about this when I saw her last January. I just thought she would be thrilled uh, that this was happening. And without missing a beat, she turns around and, and says, and now we have to make it all organic. So, oh, you're killing me. You're, you know, it, it's, it, it, that, that is a, it's an admirable goal to, to be, to go towards. But a lot of what we're buying locally isn't organic. And, and we, we certainly want to create opportunities, not only here in the urban community, but extend that to the rural communities that we're supporting yeah. through this local purchasing program. So I think, again, it, it's balance uh, and, and really figuring out your impact in the community. When I was just starting off, I was a uh, you know, passionate young man. I loved food. I was traveling all over the world and um, you know, just loved food. And it, it was fun. And then uh, was presented the opportunity to Check out to go run Cafe St. X over on 14th Street. So I got on the phone and I said, send me straight bass, send me bluefish. I want oysters. I want blue crab. Woohoo! This is going to be fabulous. <laughs> and the guy on the other end of the line said, kid, what are you talking about? We ate all those. What else do you want? And I realized right then and there the guiding hand of natural selection in our world is quite firmly holding a fork. And the way that we eat largely describes how this world is used. 
And so I set off in my career to really think about how I as a chef, as an individual, buying one case of organic chicken, buying one fish that was new and different and interesting, that flying fish, whatever it was, how we could have an impact on our community, how I could have an impact directly on the oceans. But also, just in terms of revitalization of neighborhoods, we're not just talking about the environments that sustain us, but also the neighborhoods in which we live, the neighborhoods that sustain us. You know, this really is almost the redemption of neighborhoods. And sure, there's issues with gentrification and, and other political issues as well, but there's really a huge opportunity here. And that's what I want to close on. When I was uh, first chef at Cafe St. X, a man named Robert Egger walked into my restaurant, introduced himself, and he said, hey, we're neighbors, and I want to meet you. He was the founder of DC Central Kitchen, and in the course of 20 minutes, he convinced me that a chef is more than just the sum of the ingredients that he or she puts on the table. That a chef can be more, the chef can be part of a community, a chef can be uplifting, revitalizing, and can bring opportunity to those people uh, everywhere around us, not just those we serve. And um, that's what got me introduced to DC Central Kitchen. I went as far as taking everything from my family. I've held people up at gunpoint. Um, but you know, you know, I had decided in my life that I didn't want to live like that anymore, and I was just tired. Uh, I'm 44 years old. I have been doing drugs for 32 years. I smoked crack for 23. Uh, I've had two heart attacks. I just decided that, you know, I, enough was enough. In other words, this is like a second chance for me to get my life back, and I will do so. First day of every class, you look out at the men and women who are coming in, and they can look hard as nails, you know, but it's just a mask. They're terrified of what's ahead. Hey, um, welcome, everybody. This is going to be the 21st anniversary of the kitchen this week. So much of what we do in America, in charity, is about the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. We wanted to turn it around so that everybody got liberated. Um, and that's what the kitchen's about every day. Everybody who comes in here gets served. Everybody. I am a changed person in this little bit of time. My family, they love me, but they welcome me now. And all blessings are coming to me that I cannot believe. People, places, things for me. And so with that, I'd like to, Michael to talk about what DC Central Kitchen is and some of the opportunities it presents. Sure. Well, thank you, Barton, uh, again, for allowing the kitchen to be part of this. I think we are so incredibly blessed, again, to be part of this community. Uh, we're serving close to 12,000 meals a day in this city. Um, but we could be serving 30, 40, 50, 60, 70,000 meals a day. Uh, and people will still be hungry tomorrow. Uh, what the kitchen is about and what we're using food um, as a catalyst for is to create opportunity. To, to put people in a place to break this incredibly uh, destructive and generational cycle of, of violence, addiction, incarceration, hunger, homelessness, and ultimately poverty. And we just started our 98th culinary job training class. Uh, since the recession hit in 2008, we've graduated over 600 men and women, formerly unemployed and homeless, who are now employed in the city's restaurants hotels, catering operations, institutional food systems. You go to a museum downtown, you're going to see one of our graduates. At, we have graduates working out at NIH, in law firms around town, in schools. Now they are part of this community in a very powerful and economic way. 
Many of these men and women that you saw in that video cost this city millions and millions of dollars in incarceration costs, halfway house visits, stays, um, shelter stays. Uh, and what we're trying to show is that with just a small investment, not charity, investment in this community, using food as that tool, we can create economic opportunity and economic growth and inclusion, inclusion for a vast majority of the men and women that want to be part of this community. It costs $44,000 a year to incarcerate someone in DC. It costs $12,000 to train them once, at which point they become contributing members of a tax base. They take themselves out of the welfare net of the city and actually begin to contribute to it. For a $12,000 investment, you get all of that in return. And that's the redemption story. But there's also the opportunity to prevent that. And that's what Central Kitchen has really moved on to. And that's what this video is about here. Good morning. Welcome to Shenandoah Valley Project Office. Good morning, gentlemen. How's everybody? Good. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. Transformation from destroying lives to helping lives. In 2007, I was on the streets selling drugs. Two of my friends had just got killed, and I escaped death. So um, I wanted another chance at life. I seeked help with um, DC Central Kitchen. I graduated from the Connor Yard Art Program. I'm here now at um, a school called Rossin and Justin Academy. I'm the sous chef. I'm making beautiful meals for kids, because this, this is something that I always wanted to do, work with kids. The auction this year has roughly uh, 450 registered growers, and on the buyer side, we're probably up in the 800s. DC Central Kitchen is very important to the auction here because they're one of our largest purchasers. I believe in what we do because it's just providing a good product that's healthful and fresh, that's not harvested too far ahead of time. We feel very grateful that DC Central Kitchen wants to be a part of the produce auction and buy this fresh local produce from us. If we can change somebody's life in the city, we're pleased to be a part of that. <laughs> Look what we do. We feed kids healthy meals every day. 3,500 DC public school kids. Because some of these kids, man, when they go home, they're not getting meals. At least they know when they, when they come to school, they're gonna receive a good meal. The food here, it's, it's always healthy and it's always good. I always have a salad, vegetables. I always have something like calcium, protein. How do you feel about it, Cameron? I feel great. I love the fruit because every time we get a fruit, every meal. Ooh, I like to have a good meal before I, I go to class so I can be on task and I can be ready to start my day. How do you like the vegetables and the fruit? The color is a, a little spicy. And, and uh, yes, yeah, the fruit is good, right? Oh, man. What's going on, Slim? DC Central Kitchen has changed my life, and in the process, I am changing these kids' life. My name is Howard Thomas, and I'm a graduate of DC Central Kitchen. My name is 
is Dennis Showalter, and I'm the manager here at the auction. But only a small part of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> it is though, man. DC Central Kitchen is the mom. You know, restaurants and food preparation is uh, it's an honorable pursuit. It's a pursuit, uh, it's a human pursuit. Not only does food describe to a great extent the biology of our existence here, but through food we are able to write the biography of our existence here as individuals and as community. It's an honor to serve you in restaurants. It's an honor to create community through restaurants. And especially, it's been an honor to share an evening with you here tonight. So thank you all very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>